Senator Udell. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairman Corker. And I, I couldn't agree with you and, and uh, Senator Mendes and, and uh, uh, Senator Cardin in terms of democracy and, and uh, human rights and what we, uh, what we need to do in the region. I, I wanted to focus a, a little bit on, and I thank you for, I've been listening here to a lot of your testimony, waiting in line to, to participate. And it, you've, been, you've given some very, um, I think, thoughtful approaches to us on the challenges in Latin America. And, and I, um, I'd like to focus you on the migration issue in particular. Uh, and that's because uh, it really has a direct impact on New Mexico, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that before I, I uh, um, ask a question. Beginning in 2014, as you know, and continuing to this day, there's been an influx of undocumented, uh, undocumented migrants, uh, many of them women and children from the Central American's Northern Triangle, whether El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. As these uh, migrants flee their homes, they face many incredible dangers uh, traveling along the way. Many are claiming refugee status, as you well know, uh, to escape gangs in Central America and other violence and those kinds of things. And for those who may be refugees, we have an obligation, I think, to adjudicate their cases carefully. And I think we're, we're trying to do that at the, at the uh, federal executive level. But until that happens, um, these children will be housed in leased property on an Air Force base in New Mexico, Holloman Air Force Base, which is located near White Sands in southern New Mexico. And as a result, as many as 700 of these, of these children may have a temporary home uh, in New Mexico. And uh, so there's really a bigger question here. Many Americans are wondering why are children fleeing uh, and what are the root causes of the children fleeing? Um, and I'm wondering if on this migration issue, if, if there aren't some lessons to be learned from the North. My understanding is that the net migration between the United States and Mexico is reported to be net zero. Um, how did this happen? What factors have contributed to this outcome? Is some of that applicable to what happened in the Northern Triangle? And, and uh, whoever wants to start, I'm happy to hear from Mac or Shannon, Dr. O'Neill, or? I'll be very brief because I think Dr. O'Neill spoke to this uh, yeah. perhaps a bit. Uh, Senator Udall, before you were able to join us, thank you for Yeah, and I, I apologize. I oh, wish no. I could have been here oh, for no. the whole thing. No, no. I really your, do. Your, your, your engagement <laughs> dedication has never, never been in question, I don't think, at all. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, I think uh, Dr. O'Neill pointed out in Mexico is really what you were talking and what, about. And I know she mentioned but, but, this because my staff told me, but what I would add on top of also for yeah, you ahead, please. is the is Senator Kane talked about the 750 right, million. That's where I was going. And, and the question focusing on migration, how could that best be used that's in it. order to, to uh, get to our net situation yeah. that we have in Mexico. Yeah, yeah please, I think, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 I think you've no. got exactly the, the link uh, of, of the two issues. I, I think in Mexico you had a more developed, uh, stronger uh, economy and country, and therefore some of the reforms in education with some help from the demographics and so forth, job creation with the integration of the North American platform, all of which has helped. Very much more fragile situation in Central America. And that's where the $750 million is going to have to be spent very, very thoughtfully, creatively, and effectively. And those problems, in my judgment, are going to be more difficult to solve, and they will not be solved overnight. So uh, I think you, you do have to go, though, S Senator, to the root of the, the issue there in country, because otherwise we have a Hobson's choice of a humanitarian decisions to make. So with that, I, Dr. O'Neill, I'll let you pick it up from, from there. But I think that you've got the right link, in my view, between what has worked reasonably effectively with Mexico going to the Northern Triangle. Yeah. Dr. O'Neill. Let me, let me add on to, to Mac's comments. And, and many of those that are looking carefully at what's happening in Central America see sort of three factors that are, or three main factors that are driving um, the influx up to our border. One is, is violence. And in many of these communities, especially young people, are given the choice of joining a gang, being killed, or leaving. That's the choice in some, in some neighborhoods, in some communities. Um, and so that violence uh, is driving them to our borders. 
Another issue is economic opportunity, right? We've talked a bit about the lack of jobs. We've talked a bit about the lack of education. And today, some two million young Central Americans are what they call in Spanish, ninis. They don't work and they don't study. So there's two million people, young people who, who are in this flux. They don't have a, a sort of legal role to play or nor are they in school. So that's a challenge. And then the third are the family ties. And there have been some surveys of those that are coming up to the border and the vast majority of them have, especially the young people, have either their mother or father that actually live here in the United States. So as they're trying to get away from violence, as they're in these desperate straits, they're coming to join their parents, right? And the, the other parts have, have close relatives. So those are sort of the three factors. I mean, one of the other things that we know about the violence in the Northern Triangle countries, it's, it's often very focused. So you'll have neighborhoods that are incredibly violent and not that far away will be places that aren't that violent. So it's not a blanket equal violence. There's some places that are extreme and other places that aren't so bad. And so I do think as we start thinking about how to use these $750 million effectively, one is to target those areas. It's not a broad, uh, a broad based approach, but target the places that are the most violent, that do have the fewest opportunities, uh, and where these migrants are coming from, and see what we can do in those actual localities, those sets of streets even, versus just broadly throughout a whole city. Um, and I think the other thing is that we should take the time through the State Department or others to really look at the metrics that we're measuring. What are the programs that are successful? And measuring inputs, how many officers were trained, or how many, you know, um, vehicles do we provide? I'm not sure those are the most effective measures. What we care about is reducing violence and creating opportunities. And so I think those should be metrics that we think about evaluating the programs that we might then scale up or expand to other municipalities. And, and is, your, is your judgment right now, from what all of you know of the programs that we fund now, are they doing that targeting of the communities where there's the real problem or, or would you need to, to reevaluate or actually target it, in, target it in a more uh, aggressive way on those communities? My understanding is that there are programs yeah. that are doing that, but that not all programs are created equal in terms yeah. of the impact they have on the ground. And so I think a real evaluation of the programs we have, a widespread evaluation, and then taking the ones that seem to be the most effective and expanding those versus others that that may not have sort of the bang for the buck. Yeah, Mac, did you have something? I think very much like in, in a business. I, I think uh, I think uh, the, the, the proper people in, in the government, including the Congress, need to have a very, very vigilant and sharp eye on this major investment to really see what is making a difference. It's not going to be easy. But again, we have seen examples in Colombia, for example, where our engagement has made a difference, but yeah. only with the responsibility and buy-in of the leadership within the country. Right. So I think intense focus on where the money's being spent, in terms of accountability, and also some fresh thinking is needed here. Yeah, Did Mr. Farnsworth. Thank you for the opportunity. Let me just very quickly say one of the things that seems to be a little bit different about migration patterns from Central America versus Mexico is, is the surge of unaccompanied minors. Uh, and you know, this adds a, a, an element of real pain and concern. I, I have an 11-year-old son. I can't imagine putting him on a bus from Honduras in the, in the care of a coyote and, you know, maybe to get to Chicago or someplace uh, in the north to visit with an aunt or something like this. It must be so desperate that parents are willing to do that with their unaccompanied children. And to me, um, that speaks to, you know, it's got to be really bad. To be, and whether it's a community, whether it's, you know, but, but that's the decision families are making. And I think for us to be effective, we have to recognize how desperate it really is and somehow get to that point where people find that it's in their interest to keep their kids at home rather than putting them on a dangerous hundreds of mile journey to the United States. Yeah, well, th thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say that again because I think you've given us some very, very important testimony today and I would I would uh, um, Chairman Corker and Senator Cardin I would echo what Senator um, Kane said I think it's tremendously important that we um, look at this major investment of 750 million and do some oversight and, and maybe call the administration in in terms of you know what what are your plans here and how do you plan, plan to tackle the things like the violence and the migration and the root causes that we've been talking about Thank you very much. And thank thank you, you for your thank you so much. courtesies and going over time here.